Welcome to a radical discussion of independence, free will, liberty, and the left-hand path. This is Damon Ossoff with your host, Paul Frederick. another episode of Namenosophy, where we continue to fight for liberty in the left-hand path. My guest this evening, Mr. Boyd Rice, musician, artist, actor, photographer, author, and he's got a new book out, The Last Testament of Anton LaVey. Boyd, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Yeah, and I have to give uh, props to our mutual friend, Aaron Powell of the band Alwyn, um, who I, 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 I think uh, was instrumental in getting this conversation to happen, and I think you were recently on tour with him in Europe, huh? Well, yeah, a couple years back I was on tour with him in Europe, and uh, we really only did several shows, but we went all over the place, and we had many long nights up uh, late night conversations at hotels over drinks, and that that was great. You know, that was worth the price yeah. of admission. No, that's awesome. Aaron's a great guy. So um, I did shows with him with my band as Modia Sex like many years ago, because he he lives in Dallas, I live in Houston, and so we did uh, we did a. Uh, uh, a couple of shows together back in the day, and um, I just recently kind of like reconnected with him, and, and you know he's a really he's a really great guy. And then yeah. you and I met. Um, I don't think that you would necessarily remember this because it's a while back, but 1997, you and I met at the Dome Room in Chicago when you were on tour with Death in June and Strength Through Joy. Yeah, yeah, I I loved that. that. Was a great venue. I think um, it was later like taken over by some rapper who turned it into a hip hop club or something. But that was a great venue. Yeah. Oh my God, I didn't know about that. No, I remember. So the dome room had this big picture up at the top of it. That's like there's a Zeus god like face like way up at the top. Um, it had all these tears, and it's like a really cool place. Um, and I was there with uh, other mutual friends of ours, uh, Thomas Thorne. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't, uh, Thomas used to come through town about once a year, but I haven't heard from him for ages and ages. So he's doing good. He moved to Florida. And, uh-huh. uh, and um, he, like about two years ago, he had a, they did a Electric Hellfire Club reunion show in, uh, in uh, Miami, and he invited me to, to come down, and, and we opened for him, and, and it was so awesome. It's like, you know, it's, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, whatever it was, um, and it's like, you know, Rich, Rich Frost was there, and uh, Richter, and all these old guys. And was, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So... You know, I think of this 1997 show. You were doing this. I, I kind of consider this the height of this, uh, the Total War thing. That's the song that I remember. And and when you were doing that song at that time, it was just just it, amazingly uh, incredible and powerful. I wanted to ask. Well, thank you. Did you yeah. Um, did you suspect at that time that a few years later? that America would actually be plunged into, not necessarily a total war, but a state of kind of perpetual war? Uh, no, no. But um, it's funny because when, um, at the point when the U.S. Uh, began bombing Iraq, Mute Records, mm-hmm. they, they play this music in their um, stairwells and when you're waiting on the phone. And Daniel Miller, when the first bombs dropped, he said, start playing Total War on repeat, and we'll play it constantly as long as the war goes on. So I would call up, and I'd hear this weird stuff. On, I'd say, what the hell are you playing? It's playing it, some weird noisy thing. They said, Boyd, we're playing you. That's Total War. <laughs> yeah, these, uh, you know, 
you know, the new wars aren't um, as interesting as, as the old wars. And, you know, Total War was meant to be a, a, a kind of a personal thing, you know, an inner thing. It's not actually, uh, you know, <laughs> going out and yeah. shooting at people or having bayonets or... Uh, Although I've got guns and bayonets, but, uh, but no it's more about it's it. more about like an internal, like an internal struggle. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and so I got asked about this. I saw you met Diamond in Silk recently. Oh yes, yes. How was that? Uh, that was amazing. It was like a, a uniquely American phenomenon because they're just these two gals who um, put these rants of theirs on the Internet, and then it just blew up and make, became famous because of that. And they're just like two ordinary gals who have larger-than-life personalities and strong mm -hmm. opinions, and they have transitioned from just being two average gals to these women who go on the road. And they have like a really polished showbiz act, but it's still then mm -hmm. just like telling their opinions and stuff. And, and right. people just love them, you know. I went down, uh, they were in Colorado Springs, and I went down with Whale Song Partridge, and we spent the night in the hotel where they were appearing. But that was uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> no, it looks like it. That sounds awesome. I've seen them online, um, and, and you know, everything you're saying about them is absolutely correct. They're just so intense and entertaining. And what I really like about them is it not, you know, not, not so much the, the, you know, the point where they're going with it necessarily, but fact that they're smashing expectations they're like not supposed to be supporting the things that they're talking about supporting right now and it just makes people so angry and I just love it <laughs> and this really this it, to me that's kind of LeBayan right smashing expectations you know law of the forbidden yeah but you know the thing with uh, the whole of a uh, aspect of that is like the uh, villain or the anti-hero is does piss off a lot of people, but then the people who they don't piss off are the people who love them as much as the other people hate them. So it's like mm -hmm. the room I was in was a room full of love where people were just saying, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm seeing these wild women, uh, <laughs> sassy women saying all this stuff, you know, and it, it, they're hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, they're totally, totally on cue. So this is a question that was asked to me recently, and I got to ask this to you because you knew Anton LaVey um, personally, and, and, and we're going to talk about your book, you know, um, which I think is just fabulous and has some great insights in it. But what do you think Anton LaVey, if you were alive today, what would he think about Donald Trump? Um. I just think he would love the whole atmosphere that's going on and that he would love the divisiveness and love the way yeah. people are losing their mind and he'd, you know, he was a, a very apolitical person because to him politics really didn't matter because he'd always, you know, in the 50s he was living the same life as the life he was living during the period when I knew him, which was the last 10 years of his life. So he wasn't one of these people who's dependent upon whatever is happening in politics and thinking, oh, well, when the new person gets into office, then my life can change, then I can be happy. And, you know, he wasn't mm -hmm. a person who lived that way. So on one level, it would be irrelevant to him, but I think he would like um, Trump because he's, uh, he's a shit stirrer and he's uh, mm -hmm. a tough guy, and he's, you know, he's a, ever since I was in high school, people always scolded me for being apolitical. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, politicians are just, they're these people who are they're liars, they tell you whatever they think you want to hear, and when they get into office, they don't keep any of their promises. And, you know, it's like, I'm not waiting for, uh, you know, I can change my life right now if I want to. I'm not waiting mm -hmm. for the political situation to change. So mm -hmm. I would always say, I'll, I'll be interested in politics when a businessman runs for office. So, mm -hmm. you know, so I always thought, well, if a businessman or an engineer, somebody was in charge of the government, they'd, uh, they'd understand the way things really work in the real world. They wouldn't think, mm -hmm. you know, oh, if we throw a bunch of money at a problem, you know, if we send uh, billions of dollars over to Iran, they're going to love us all of a sudden, you know. Mm -hmm. They're, they're mm -hmm. idiotic. So, 
you know. So I think I, I think he would just appreciate the whole phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So that's what I tend to think too. Um, is that he would just be he would just be chuckling about, about exactly. You know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I when that the last election happened, I um, you know I was I was out at a bar drinking and watching everything happen on the on the TV and thinking, oh, you, you know, Hillary's going to win, right? There's just nothing, you know, no other possibility here. Um, and then when I woke up in the morning. I got a text telling me that Trump won, and now and again I didn't have a dog in this race. You know, I, I, I didn't have a horse in this race. But when I uh-huh. saw that, I just I just laughed. I just laughed so hard because um, it was so unexpected. It's so bizarre, and he's so contrarian, and he's so you know. He, he, but at the same time, you know, I feel you know, I, to to invest your 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 life and your personality and your destiny in another person. Right, a demagogue of any kind is kind of collectivist and, and, and not very um, satanic or individualist. But still, it's goddamn entertaining. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I've got to say. It's, this has been the most entertaining three years uh, that I can remember. <laughs> so let's talk about, let's talk about Anton LaVey. Let's talk about your book. Tell me why you wrote this book and, and the whole, the whole vibe and your vision and, and what you're trying to, what you're trying to do with it. Um, well, I, I sort of first, uh, I'd always, you know, had in the back of my mind that at some point I'm going to have to write something about LaVey and all these stories I have about him and, and so on. But, um, a couple of years ago, this, uh, organization in Hollywood called Lethal Amounts put on this Anton LaVey show on Hollywood Boulevard. And they had all these photos and LaVey memorabilia, and it was like the 20th anniversary of his death. And the people who attended, like if they paid an extra 100 bucks a piece, they could go up in this little theater and uh, hear me speak and Carl LaVey and Kenneth Anger. So mm-hmm. all these people paid this money to see all of us, and mm-hmm. and I just thought, oh well, you know, the time is obviously right because there's a new LeVay book. There's um, a number of documentaries coming out. It was a ridiculous documentary about him and Jane Mansfield, which I, I couldn't even finish watching. You know, it was just mm-hmm. horrible. But but it indicates that there's an interest there, and I, I and me and Carla shared the stage. And we just sort of like shared our memories about her father and. And I thought, wow, this is some really great stuff. You know, it's like people don't really, you know, I grew up right when that whole thing was happening. So I remember Anton LaVey as a pop culture icon. And I remember seeing him on the newsstand and seeing the Satanic Bible in the checkout line at the supermarket being offered for Mm -hmm. sale. I mean, it was a huge phenomenon. And I just thought, you know, it's like people who didn't live through that really have no idea of imagining how how huge it was or what it was like. So I tried to like capture something of that, like what that period of time was like and what he was like as a person, because um, he, he's far more complex than uh, than a lot of things would uh, lead you to believe. You know? He's a very interesting guy. No, I think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head with the complexity. I mean, that's a, definitely complex. And there's one point in the book where you talk about he kind of uh, would pivot between, like, several different personalities. Like, you had the German, you know, the German <laughs> expressionist, expressionist personality. Then he had the old, um, old uh, Jewish cynic personality. And then he had a Fu Manchu personality. And it's like, no, that just really lays it out. That, that makes so much sense when you consider that, that he kind of fluctuated between these, these different things. And you can see this in his works, too, that his, the different works that he put out, um, even different, you know, the ceremonies, like in the satanic rituals, all, each of them kind of partakes of one of these, like, one of these vibes or one of his, um, you know, one of his personalities. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, Every aspect of everything he was into is like part of this vast cosmology, and it's really hard to be able to get your head around the whole thing unless you sort of 
ex- spent a lot of time with him, and you know, it's like every week he would uh, at a certain point, you know, I'd go over at seven in the evening, and I'd leave like at six in the morning. So I'd stay there until the sun came up, and every week he would show me one of his favorite movies, and uh, so I got to see a lot of movies I never would have seen under any other circumstances. Uh, and, and, what, film and what time? What, what time period was this when you were meeting with him? It was in. Um, it started in the late eighties, like late nineteen eighty six or early eighty seven, and okay. um, and I went over every week, sometimes twice a week, until I left San Francisco in October of eighty nine, but. After that, I, I went back all the time, you know, up, up until mm-hmm. the time when he died, and I saw him really just a couple weeks before he died. I went out, I took the Amtrak out there and did an interview with him for Seconds Magazine, and that, mm-hmm. as it turns out, is his, his, his last interview. So that's what the last testament of Anton Zandor LaVey, one of the things in it is his final interview. And mm-hmm. Blanche Barton and her... Uh, updated uh, biography of him said that that's one of the best interviews he ever did. It was probably because I was so familiar with him and knew what mm-hmm. he was interested in and knew what to ask. So, so um, I'm glad that got back in print again. And that is, Excuse um, me. That, that's like one of the most touching parts, I think, of the book um, that, that I've looked at is when you talk about how you got the phone call. Oh God, yeah. And and you know what I think? Um, I mean, I remember w- where I was the day. I mean, maybe that says something about you know people of you know uh, who were in- into Satanism at the time when he died. It's kind of like our Kennedy moment or the nine eleven moment that you're always going to remember where you are when, and what was going on when you heard that Anton Lavey died. Because um, it's one of those things I think no one expected, you know, that that to happen. No one thought that that was really going to happen. But could you can you talk a little bit about um, about that experience? Uh, well, we, me, and Death and June had done a show someplace in New York City, and there was a goth club called the Bank, and it was uh, in a, a place that had originally been yeah. a bank. So they were throwing yeah. after our show. They were. I, I What's that? that club too. I, I was just going to say I played at that club. I know exactly what you're. Oh talking. wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they were throwing a private party for us and some other people at that at the bank, and uh, I was talking with all these young people who were interested in Anton Lavey, and they were all saying, you know, what's Anton Lavey like, and blah blah blah, and, you know. And, yeah. and some of them actually said something about uh, when he died, and I said, no, Lavey said. Um, you know, he, he's not going to die because it would give too many assholes, uh, you know, pleasure. So he's just mm-hmm. going to have to tough it out and live forever. And then I get this call and I go way down in this bank vault and, you know, hear that uh, Anton LaVey had died. And, you know, he seemed perfectly healthy when I'd seen him a short while earlier. Wow. That's really weird because now I'm putting together the timing of all that. So what, that was like, was it 97 or 98? Yeah, 97, I think. So, because I'm, I'm putting it all together that I came through there with uh, um, Morphine Angel was the band that I was in at the time. That was the band that, uh, um, you know, we did shows with the Electric Hellfire Club and stuff like that. And we, that's when we came through there, and it must have been shortly after you were there and heard all that. Um, so it's really interesting putting together all the, the timing on this. Um, and another interesting thing is you mentioned how, you know, you wanted to fill in the gaps for sort of how big all this stuff was in that, you know, in kind of that mid-60s era when it was really going on and it was really hot, you know. Because yeah. that's something for me... Like I'm, um, you know, I'm 51 years old. I was born in 19. I was born in 1968. So by the time I found the Satanic Bible when I was 13 years old, you know, this this, this shit was all over. Um, as, as far as I can tell, I'm plus I lived in in uh, Nebraska, right? So okay, there's not so there's not anyone else around, you know, who, who's into this stuff. So 
you know, I, I discovered this book and this philosophy, and it was incredibly empowering, completely, you know, completely changed my outlook on life. You know, I was, I was a depressive, feeling sorry for myself kid, you know, um, at the time, and, and that book was, like, really empowering, and it turned things around, you know, it, 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 it uh, inspired me to turn things around for myself. But I always had this question, is, is this stuff actually still going on, you know? Is this stuff real? Are there actually people out here doing that? And I never knew that. I never knew that, you know, for many years later, like until, you know, 1988 or so, um, when I started to make connections. Um, but that whole time, and I think there's a lot of people like that who don't know about that time period. You don't know how big this was. You don't know how embedded in that local, in that regional, you know, West Coast culture, um, Satanism was, was becoming, you know. And um, LaVey was extremely well-known uh, figure in San Francisco just because he was an eccentric and, you know, he made good copies for the newspaper. He was like a, an organist and a, a stage hypnotist and he, uh, you know, went to art fairs to try to sell his paintings and things. And so it's before he did the Church of Satan. He was a very well-known figure. And then he started doing his uh, um, lectures, series of occult lectures, a thing called the Magic Circle. And, you know, he'd have ads for that in the newspaper every week in San Francisco, and people would show up and pay to hear these lectures. And then mm -hmm. um, some cop who he worked with on the police force really liked him and would always attend these lectures and at one point he said you know Anton you've you've got enough uh, enough material here to start your own religion you could start your own church and so he thought well yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> so um, yeah so it evolved from that into the order of the trapezoid, and then um, that was just like a more serious, formalized sort of a, a cult mm -hmm. fraternity. But uh, eventually, you know, he, he changed it into the Church of Satan and realized that, that he could take these ideas that could remain in this closed circle of like an underground of a cultist, or he could take these same ideas and project them outwards into pop culture so that mm -hmm. everybody would be influenced by him. Everybody in the mm -hmm. United States would know who he was. His face would be synonymous with those ideals. And, you know, it worked beyond his wildest dreams. Because it's mm -hmm. when, in the 50s, he was down in L.A., uh, you know, working in these strip clubs, playing an organ. He was virtually unknown. And mm -hmm. he came back... He came back to Hollywood 10 years later, and he was as famous as any of the movie stars he was hanging out with. Mm -hmm. He was like just as famous as Jane Mansfield or Sammy Davis Jr. or um, I'm forgetting the guy's name. Uh, oh, anyway, you know, he, he met a lot of people when he lived out there. He lived in Jane's uh, Pink Palace for a long time mm -hmm. after she died. Yeah. I think he saw that the group dynamic wasn't really working out and that he would just put this information out there and that he would essentially be a recluse. And he, he would still, like, fly all over the world. Like, uh, there were, like, Mexican movie stars who were into uh, Satan. <laughs> and, and they had giant statues of Satan in their house. And he would go visit them or he would go visit people in Europe. And, uh, you know, but he, he's... You know, got to a point when I met him, he said, I can count on the fingers of my two hands how many people walked through that door there. And I still have a lot of fingers left over. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, if you, if you look at that, like, a movie like Satanus, mm -hmm. and you see LeVay is in this room full of people, and they're all interesting people, and they're all from every walk of life. And they're obviously mm -hmm. unique people. And uh, but he's up there talking, and then all these other people are talking, and he's just sort of sitting there smiling to himself and waiting for them to shut up so he could continue talking. And right. that's, that's not a good dynamic for him. It's not a good dynamic yeah. for the people who want to hear what he's into, because you know it's like our, you know, our evenings. I, I would just you know I would shut up and listen, 
until right. you know. <laughs> I was just like, I don't want to like interject my opinion here when I can sit here and be regaled with these amazing tales from you know. Right. No, and I know I know exactly what uh, part of Satanist you're talking about. All these people are carrying on, and uh, and and Anton can't get a word in edgewise. And when you watch the movie, you're like, I wish these people would shut up because I want to know what he says. You know, um, yeah. I don't, I don't want to care about you know I, Isaac Bonowitz like getting his getting his penis blessed. You know, and <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the famous. That's one of the famous moments from that that film. Um, yeah, the other but you can also was, see. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say you can also see. It's like it really did start off with even though the group dynamic wasn't appropriate, it started off with a good group dynamic because these, these were people who were intellectuals back when that word meant something that wasn't derogatory. I mean, they were people who were self-taught and intellectually curious, and they were individuals living their own kind of Epicurean life, and they came together around this man and these ideas. And, you know, it's like uh, by, by the time you're talking about, it's like the people who bought... Um, the Satanic Bible were like uh, teenagers listening to heavy metal music or something. So it was a whole mm -hmm. different demographic. So that really wouldn't have been worth uh, LaVey's time. So and didn't you say um, that he said at one point that um, everything was like over in 1969? <sighs> no, he said the world turned to shit in 1969. Oh, the world turned to shit in 1969. <laughs> So was there anything, um, did he have anything particular in mind? Like what the, is oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, Manson murder. he didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to think about it. I said, so when exactly did everything turn to shit? When did the cultural inversion start? And he said, he didn't hesitate a bit. He said, 1969. That's when feminism raised its ugly head. Women stopped wearing garters and stockings, and everybody was wearing pantyhose. It all went to, you know, went rotten in 1969. So um, that's interesting, and 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 you know, I think one of the things that Levey was rebelling against, of course, he's rebelling against, you know, the obvious things like Christianity and, and mediocrity, but he was also rebelling against the white light, um, so-called white light, you know, paganism and 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 witchcraft which he criticizes these things in the Satanic Bible. And at that time, you know, feminism and all of that stuff is wrapped up in feminism and a left-wing political movement. And, I mean, this is, is, to me, seems very clearly something that he was also rebelling against. Um, do you think that that's true? Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, fuzzy thinking of the hippie generation. He just saw mm -hmm. that as being... Like I did. I mean, I was 13 at the time, but even I could see that this is something that's weak and confused, and you've got all these people who are like in their late teens and early 20s. Your brain doesn't stop developing until age 25. So you get all these young people with undeveloped brains, and they're all ingesting um, mind-altering drugs. So of course they can all sit around and listen to whatever album they're listening to, and agree that everybody should love one another and there should be peace and universal brotherhood and all that crap. So, you know, LeVay hated that. He hated that fuzzy thinking. And it's the ironic thing is, like, that fuzzy thinking of the 60s, of the hippie era, it's like the exact bedrock of modern liberalism is based mm -hmm. on all that fuzzy thinking, these nice sounding ideas that are just highly delusional and unrealistic, you know. But now people are being forced to, to, to you know, alter their existence to try to echo that. And uh, it's not working out well. No, so there's a modern uh, satanic movement. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen the T-shirts that say satanic feminism. Um, there's, a, there's a current movement that calls itself satanic that really embraces all of those um, left-wing, you know, hippie ideas. And they're kind of trying to whitewash LeVay out of it. You know, LeVay had, a, had really strong ideas about 
women and the virtue of women and the power of women, and he believes there's two sexes. And, um, you know, this is all apparent throughout, you know, the, the complete witch. Um, but now this, this modern movement is in this weird position of trying to carry forward this torch of what um, LaVey started, but also at the same time, it's like they're trying to surgically remove this one piece out of it. And um, I'm not sure where it's going to go. What do, you, what do you think about that? Um, I, I don't think it will go anywhere, you know. It's, um, yeah, I've, I've heard tell of the, these people get together and pick up trash in certain neighborhoods and they attend yeah. uh, women's rights rallies and uh, show a satanic uh -huh. presence. Uh, you know, if, if you want to be a liberal, just be a liberal. There's plenty of organizations for liberals out there. Don't try to co-opt something that's absolutely the antithesis of liberalism and then, you know, make it into something nice. No, they're really like, I, Yeah, yeah, because, um, you know, and I, excuse me, I'm doing some snuff. Um, I think, um, where was I going with that? I forget what you just said. I, I um, did some snuff and I uh, lost my train of thought. Yeah, well, um, you know, that was his... One of his pet peeves was to be people who called themselves Satanists and, but would always add, oh, oh but we're nice guys. And he, mm -hmm. I remember he said to me once, he said, because the people at research um, got pissed off at Anton LaVey and, and at me, and they said, Anton LaVey used to be a really nice guy until he started hanging out with you. And I told <laughs> LaVey that, and he laughed, and he said, I've never been a really nice guy. He said, damn it, Lloyd, I'm a miserable son of a bitch. I don't want people going around saying I'm a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, I can understand during the satanic panic uh, where people trying to say, oh, no, we aren't these horrible people. But I think, you know, the satanic panic went away, and they're still doing that. They're still trying to convince everybody they're nice guys. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's... That's not why I was attracted to Anton LaVey or the Church of Satan. I was attracted because it was mysterious and it was all about the forbidden and the shadow side and it seemed dangerous, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if I was 13 nowadays and exposed to any of these people, modern people who call themselves Satanists, claim to be Satanists, I just, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what the appeal would be. I don't know who they're appealing to. And I, I, I wanted to mention, when you talk about the Satanic Bible being available in supermarkets at the time, uh -huh. which yep. is so in, inconceivable to me. However, I do have a friend in Houston who was around in the 60s and was hip to all this stuff back then. And he had told me that that's where he got the Satanic Bible originally, was at a supermarket in, in Houston, Texas. So it was available in supermarkets well outside of California. Um, if it's in Texas, oh. then, you know, that's, 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 that's some cultural penetration is what that means. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I got my uh, copy of a food basket supermarket in Lemon Grove, California. Mm -hmm. And I remember I also saw in there um, uh, The Devil's Avenger. And mm -hmm. we didn't get it, like, the very time I saw it. And mm -hmm. I never saw it again, you know, until, like, a, I found a copy 20 years later or something. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that stuff was everywhere. I mean, people, I, I go into it in the book, and I've talked about it elsewhere, about how um, there, were, there was a weekly magazine called Van Myth and Magic. And it was mm -hmm. sort of an encyclopedia of the occult. And there was a billboard for Man, Myth, and Magic with an, an Austin Spare uh, drawing of like sort of this Baphomet goat man guy on the cover. And mm -hmm. there was a billboard for that in Lemon Grove. There were commercials for it on TV. And the commercial said, finally, at last, there's a magazine devoted to witchcraft, demonology, the tarot, voodoo, uh -huh. black magic. And, uh, and I just thought, wow, this is going to be great. So uh -huh. there's this big occult revival. And it's, partially because I think LeVay was spearheading that. Mm -hmm. 
So all uh-huh. this occult stuff was going out because people were thinking about that. I just saw, what, what was the episode? I was just watching an episode of some television show last night, or a, a couple nights ago, where um, they were talking, uh, a magazine publisher was talking about, um, oh, you're going to do an article about the Satanic Occult Club in San Francisco? I don't know if that's a good idea. And it mm-hmm. was like this show from 1970 or something. They're obviously referring to the Church of Satan. Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's an interview that you do in here um, where you ask him, some members of your organization say they believe in Satan as an anthropomorphic deity. Um, <sighs> Anton says the people who believe in an anthropomorphic Satan are possibly uh, the ideal or born Satanists. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, where do you think he really stood on that question? Well, I think, um, you know, we discussed at length um, manipulating archetypes is, is a basic part of lesser magic. And, uh, you know, he says everybody has an archetype, and if you understand what it is, and if you manipulate it, you can use it to your advantage. For instance, he said there are some people who are Satanists, and they don't look terribly Satanic, or they don't look sinister. They maybe look like um, a librarian or something. He said, well, a person like that could take advantage of that archetype and, you know, wear a tweedy suit with leather patches on the elbows and try to look professorial, and people would accord them that respect that you would give a professor. So they could make, you know, even if they look ineffectual, they could make it work for them. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, he really saw Satan as um, one of the most, (laughs) one of the most powerful archetypes of, uh, you know, the last few millennia of uh, Western civilization. And he, he realized at a certain point that he just incarnated that and that's, mm-hmm. that's what made him decide to go with the Church of Satan. Mm-hmm. Is that he just sort of, uh, he was asked to do a black mass at an event, and he, he came out and, uh, you know, with his sword and, like, yelled out, open wide the gates of hell. And the room just mm-hmm. fell silent. And, and people mm-hmm. were just, people on the edge of their seats and just w- looking and watching, and, and they were just hypnotized by it. And that's when he realized, you know, oh, my God, this really is a powerful thing. This is, mm-hmm. you know, it's people responding to me as though I were the devil incarnate. And it's like, if I can have this influence over a room of some of the best and brightest of San Francisco's elite, then imagine, you know, how easy it would be to uh, <laughs> reach the American public with this imagery. And, you know, imagery is uh, a part of, man's a very visual animal. And imagery is an important part of religious ceremony. It's an important part of politics. It's an important part of, like, rock and roll. Uh, You can't really underestimate the the length to which you can use imagery or pageantry or something to, um, you know, to make your point for you. (laughs) Because I... I, when I, I just saw pictures of LeVay in front of that black house, and I didn't need to read anything, you know, because I knew he was doing this in, in the mid-60s when uh, friends of the Hell's Angels who, um, you know, were friends with my father, and they are friends with me, and they came back from San Francisco one week and said, because I was always into the occult, and this guy says, hey, what, what would you say if I told you there was a place in San Francisco called the Church of Satan? And I said, and it's a real church? And he said, yeah, they've even got a building. It's all painted black. And I said, what do they believe in? He said, well, rational self-interest and, um, you know, men taking control of their own destinies. And I, I said, well, what's that have to do with Satan? And he said, well, they also practice, the, they practice black magic and curse people and do have these great rituals with a lot of naked ladies. And mm-hmm. I didn't even have to know anything more about it. Just for me to know that there are people someplace doing this 
it just made me think that the possibilities of life just opened wide for me. I just thought yeah. it really is possible for a person to just live by their own law, to do exactly what they want to do. Because if you think of the world of 1966, I mean, think of what was on TV. It was still very much like, you know, my three sons sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, like people didn't even have really long hair yet in 1966. That was, you know. And uh, that line, actually that line that you just uh, shared with us from the book about, oh, yeah, it's about rational self-interest and men taking back their own lives. That's one that I highlighted on here. That's a really powerful line. And it's also, I think it really, it really sums it up really well, you know. Rational self-interest, personal responsibility, that's the elevator, you know, the elevator speech about what Satanism is. And um, if that appeals to you, if that makes sense to you, then that indicates that you're on, you're on that side of it. You know, you're on that side of the, the moral compass, as it were, as far as the question about individualism versus, you know, collectivism and altruism and all of these things. Um, yeah, but still, e even, like, the best ideas are not appropriate for everybody because he, he sort of felt that um, those ideas about rational self-interest and all that stuff, placing your, yourself in the center of your own universe, it sort of led to the uh, me generation where it was mm -hmm. a bunch of people who weren't really cut out to uh, be the center of their own universe. He had the whole thing about uh, people who say, oh, well, we, we think we're our own God. You know, mm -hmm. and he'd say, well, oh, if, if that person's their own God, they've got a terrible religion, they've got a piss-poor mm -hmm. religion, you know. <laughs> so it's like anything, any good idea, I think, you know, when it's taken over by the public can be, you know, degraded, diluted. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I think it, it inevit inevitably will. Yeah. <laughs> no, it gets, uh, it gets, it gets mass produced. Something's always lost, and it always loses a little bit of the essence. Um, but you know, getting back to the, you know, the atheism question, and this is something. I, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's because it comes up. You know, sat satanic atheism is a thing. That's explicitly like what a mo lot of modern groups say. And, and they say, oh, it's, just, it's so obvious. It's just so obvious that we're atheists, you know? And in my experience, it's not that obvious. You know, I can't see, <laughs> I can't see you going to, like, you know, Christopher Hitchens and saying, you know, oh, yeah, you know, Satanism and atheism, it's the same thing. You know, I think he's going to tear that apart. And when you go back and you look in, in the Satanic Bible, you know, I mean, he, the only time he even mentions atheism in that book, well, the books before the current forwards that are in it, but the earlier versions of this book, the only time atheism comes up in it is when he criticizes, you know, he criticizes Christian atheism. And in the chapter, um, you know, hell, hell, the devil on how to sell your soul, he talks about how, you know, he, he addresses that question, you know, what is Satan? Is there a Satan? And, and he talks about dark forces in nature. And he says some, some Satanists don't even deal with this question. So it, it, it's, it's not even necessary, right? And this is a, uh, an important aspect, I think, of Satanism, is that belief is not that significant of a thing in it. That's not a, a prerequisite for being able to take control of your life and your destiny. But he talks about, you know, like dark forces in nature, and he talks about archetypes, an archetype as something that, um, you know, that other people can access. Not just, you know, this, not just my trip, but, you know, other people can, like, access this. And whatever that is, I'm not sure what it is, but to me, that's not atheism. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what you were saying about belief is a prerequisite. I think, you know, it could go way further than that. I go way further than that. I... I think that uh, the process of belief is innately flawed. The, mm -hmm. the process of belief is like a fundamental form of tyranny. Mm -hmm. It tyrannizes the mind because belief is about group think. Whatever you believe, whatever uh -huh. stripe of belief, it's like the realities of life as it is. Life as it is doesn't need explanations. You don't have to believe in, you know, 
anything that you can see with the evidence of your senses. And the only thing that gets in the way of the evidence of your senses is, is if you have beliefs that, you know, confuse them. <laughs> so I think every belief is a false ideology. I, you know, the road I'm on is abandon belief, abandon ideology, you know, philosophies, uh -huh. forget about it. You don't need uh -huh. any of those things. And if you have them, they're, they're just, you know, they're going to tie you into group think. Mm -hmm. so that's uh, very that's very insightful uh, and I think that's accurate yeah belief always like implies uh, it implies group thing it implies well this is what I got to say to um, other people about it and um, you know why is that why is that necessary for you to you know cut your own cut your own way through the universe as it were Yeah, so, so where were we going with that again? <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. But, um, <laughs> I, I thought you made a really good point about uh, belief, the, the structure of belief. The whole nature of belief is unnecessary because belief is connected with uh, groupthink of, of some kind. Um, okay, I think well, I know, what I, I know what I was going to say, is that I was going to say the, the, the deal is that Nine out of ten people are hardwired to believe. They're hardwired to be part of the collective. And then one percent of people are hardwired to have independent thought and to think for themselves. And that ratio has remained the same throughout the history of the world. And those, you know, it's like you don't look down at the collective because those are the people who sort of make things work. They're necessary. And um, you don't resent the people who are on top because they're actually making things happen. So you need these two parts of the puzzle to have the whole machine work. But to, to posit this idea that we're all equal and then the, the contrary idea that we're all unique individuals, like neither of those things make sense. You know, 90% yeah. of people are hardwired one way because it's necessary and 10% of people are hardwired another way because it's necessary. And you just you fall into one category or the other, and if you're in the collective, you you obviously aren't aware of it. <laughs> yeah, you know the thing is, what I think about the collective is, you know, it's it's okay. Collectivism is okay if it's voluntary, and then I would say, if it's voluntary, it's not really collectivism. It's more like you know cooperation or collaboration, or people are just doing whatever they do and not worrying about it. Well, the problem that we have, one of the problems that we have in the world is that, is that collectivism is kind of forced, you know, from on high, from, you know, governmental systems and whatnot. Um, and to me, a lot of, like, Satanism is about trying to break out and liberate oneself from whatever forces, you know, try and coerce you and try and push you down into conformity. You know what I mean? Um. Yeah, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I don't believe that anybody acts other than what their innate character is. So if your innate character is to, to be outside of all that, you will be. Even if you, even if you want to be inside that, you will be on the outside. And um, the people who collect it, it's the same thing. It's like they would be into some sort of group thing, whether it was forced upon them or it's voluntary. And it's, you know, they've got all the options in the world. They can, there's a million different ways they can dress. There's a million things they can be into. And they all choose to be into the same handful of things. They all seem to, like, you know, wear their baseball cap the same way or whatever. So sure. I, I really don't think they have any choice. I don't think it's a matter of choice. I think most people are compelled to do something or to not do something because of the way they are. So I was going to say, uh, I was looking at this other um, piece that you mentioned in here about people who imagine Anton to be brooding, gloomy, and dour have no idea the vast scope of his personality or his complexity. And LaVey was nothing if not complex. And the different aspects of his personality were like a puzzle formed of many interlocking pieces. And you also talk about um, here about the kind, uh, his kindness. 
and he had a kind uh, aspect to his personality. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, he was a kind of, you know, he, he was grew up in another generation, so he um, appreciated a lot of things that uh, have sort of been lost in the modern world. So he appreciated, like, tenderness, and he appreciated, like, corny old love songs and things. And he felt like people are just sort of debased now. They, they sort of have forgotten really how to love, and they've forgotten how to hate appropriately. And mm -hmm. so he could, he could like, go to the extremes in both of those. And they, you know, he uh, loved, I forget what it was called, but there was um, some opera about uh, Roy Dees, who um, he was, like, uh, the king of this kingdom. He was uh, involved in some war. All these people were dying, and he had a favorite tree, and the tree got hurt and the tree was dying, and he was standing in front of the tree singing a song to it and weeping about how mm. much he was going to miss that tree. And, mm. you know, the tree meant more to this guy. He had this tenderness for the tree that he didn't have for um, humanity in general. <laughs> right. And, like, he had for animals, too. So that's something oh, that he always Oh, God, about, yeah. Okay? Like, his love for animals, his love for, his, you know, his Togar the lion, and Dobermans, um, did you ever get to uh, witness witness that side of him per, uh, firsthand? Oh God, yeah, yeah. He had um, he had um, a, a couple of these desert cats. He had a black cat. He had a Maine coon cat. He had a boa constrictor, and um, the black cat was dying at one time, and it was getting so weak that it couldn't even leap up on his lap anymore. And he fed that cat. That cat was getting skinnier and skinnier. He fed that cat with an eyedropper until it, it eventually just, he woke up one morning and it was dead. And then he got a uh, sort of metallic briefcase with, uh, with locks on it. And he put that cat in that briefcase. And that cat... <laughs> remained in his kitchen probably until the day he died. Mm. He just loved that cat. And he loved Togar, too. And mm -hmm. I, um, Togar's, um, one of Togar's son was a lion named Trouble that was still at the San Francisco Zoo when I lived in San Francisco. So I'd always go and uh, see him at feeding time, and I, I recorded a bunch of his roars and sampled them on one of my old albums, like I think it was Blood and Flame or something. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Sample Togar. Yeah. That's cool. That's no, nice that, was Togar's, that was Togar's son, um, uh, oh, Trouble. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, still, it's the bloodline. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, you know, they passed a law in the city of San Francisco that uh, it was illegal to keep wild animals at your house just because uh -huh. of LeVay's lions because that lion would roar at all times of night and keep people awake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can't do anything anymore. <laughs> hey, so so what about you, Boyd? Uh, are, 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 do you have animals? Oh, yes. Well, have, you have um, a cat person, uh, two, dog person? Cat person, absolutely. We've got two lovely cats. Um, I'm, I'm sitting on the bed here, and I, we've got a black and white tuxedo cat named Mr. T, and we've got um, a big fat tabby cat named JJ. He's probably downstairs someplace or outside in the yard. And <laughs> these guys are like um, like our familiars. It's like Mr. T loves uh, my wife Karen, and JJ's always in sleeping with me right up by my head. And they follow us around. <laughs> we're, whatever room we're in, they follow us around and lay as close to us as they can. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, yeah. I was a cat, a cat person way back in the day, but then I acquired allergy to cats. And so, um, so now I'm a dog person. And I've got two uh, Dobermans and a Dachshund. And, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the full spectrum. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a total spectrum, and yeah, no, we're like we're like family. Um, we're we're all like family, and 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 I love them so much. I don't have children either. These are my my children. I'm I'm married. I have a wife, um, and and the dogs are our babies, and you know that's just an important thing. I mean, you, you, people who have animals that that have the connection with animals. It's like that says something about right there about who they are and, and what they're made of and what their what their their moral fiber is, you know. Yeah, well, it's it's amazing that uh, it seems like animals become more and more popular the more um, this downward spiral of history gets. It's like it's sort of the last bastion of something pure is a relationship with an animal. And, yeah. You just look on on the internet and all the crazy cat videos and all the funny dog videos and stuff. You know, yeah. people are really fond of their animals. Yeah. So, um, so some other things I wanted to ask you about. You you've been to because there's a lot. I mean, you've done you've done a lot of shit, um, and it's just hard to like encompass it all into this, but. Um, so you went to Rene Le Chateau. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine is over there right now. He's um, taking some pictures for me. Is that right? Well, I'm, yeah, well, I mean, he I was just... Obsessed with this. I became obsessed with this in, in like, um, I don't know, like 98 or so. I read the book Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and one of the things that came out of it is I, I started a musical project called Asmodeus X, which was, to some extent, um, based on some of the, 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 the ideas and information out of that. And I've always wanted to go there, never had a chance. I saw you went there. You know, what was it like? Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing because it's just... Um, I, we went there with um, Fox Television. Um, did, uh, they were going to do Bring Back This uh, Old TV Show in Search Of. It used to be Leonard Demoy uh, announced yeah. uh, In Search Of. Yeah, so yeah. they're going to bring that back for a while. And these, uh, the producer of this show like, liked my music. And so he found out I was into that, and so they flew me over there. And, wow. um, yeah, so I got to see the place in person. And it, it's very impressive. And... Um, and a lot of, when you actually go there and see this stuff, you're aware that most of the people who write books about the mystery of Brown Le Chateau have never actually been there. <laughs> Is that right? And, and, yeah, yeah, because um, when you're there, you see all sorts of things jump out at you. Um, and we went, uh, the sacristy was, uh, the door of the sacristy was nailed shut for some reason, and this woman allowed us and the camera crew to take the nails out and go inside this old thing with a dirt floor and spider webs and, you know, it, it was, there's a lot of amazing stuff there. And the, the um, tombstone of uh, Berenger Saunier, mm -hmm. somebody had taken a chisel to it and chiseled away so his cheekbone looked like a cheekbone of, he made his face look like a skeleton. Like a skull. Oh wow! Wow! And um, it was very strange because it looked very intentional. And then I was on the mm -hmm. other side of the cemetery, and I found, and it's it was a weird kind of yellowy colored rock stone. I don't know what kind of stone it was. I was on the other side of the cemetery, and I saw this weird triangular shaped yellow stone, and it was the very piece that had been knocked out of his tombstone. I mm. held it up to his cheek, and it like you know. Made a perfect face. Wow, oh, that's amazing. So, did you? Uh, so, what happened? Did you keep it? Did you glue it back in? Or? Oh no, I kept it. I kept it. Okay. I was just looking at it a few days ago. As a matter of fact, <laughs> somebody was over here, and I had uh, there was a plastic bag with all these old relics in it. And somebody said, "What's that weird piece of stone?" And I, I told them the uh, Renoir Chateau story. And they, uh, yeah, so there's yeah. A personal theory about the Rene Le Chateau story? Do you think, uh, like, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, is that an accurate um, idea? Is there more to it than that? Well, yeah, I, you know, I 
me and this idiot girl wrote a whole book about this one time. And I wrote 10 of the chapters, and she wrote three of the chapters. But okay. we had a deal with Red Wheel Weiser, and because of her being an asshole, this thing was never printed. And yeah. If it had been printed, I'd probably be you know, a wealthy man now. But <laughs> if it had been printed, I would still be answering questions about Renly Chateau you know, 20 years later. So it's probably good that that... Uh, <laughs> book wasn't printed. It didn't become a bestseller. <laughs> it allowed me to have some normal kind of life. <laughs> but yeah, so what, yeah. What, what, I, what, was your I, angle, what was your angle on it? Well, without being able to explain the whole story, I don't... Um, I don't know if I could um, tell you what my final theory was, but I, I think there's something there, and I think I know what it is, and I think I know where it is. Because mm. there's, um, I had a map of, I noticed there were like certain recurring symbols there, where there mm -hmm. would be a symbol, and not far from it would be a very similar symbol. So to see two of these symbols in one place, I, I got a map of that the church at Reynolds Chateau, and I made dots on all these pairs of symbols. And I drew these lines through several different pairs of symbols, and they all intersected at the very same place. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think I wrote an open letter to the mayor of Renly Chateau and said, you know, if you get ground penetrating radar, I'll show you, what, you know, where wow. to examine. But never heard anything back. Wow. We were supposed to meet the mayor of Renville Chateau while we were there and, uh, uh -huh. and uh, have, have lunch with him. But at the last moment, something came up. But uh, the Fox people were really worried because I said, oh, I've got a great, uh, great uh, joke to tell the mayor of Renville Chateau. And they said, well, what is it? And I said, why do um, the French plant rows of trees along those long avenues out in the country. They mm -hmm. said, I don't know. Why? And I said, so the German troops can march in the shade. And they said, that's <laughs> terrible. He said, please <laughs> don't say that. Please don't. You'll embarrass us all. Oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the closest I came, I was in Paris in 2012 and um, I was at and I wanted to go to Rene Le Chateau but I couldn't convince the people that I was with to go that direction so I <laughs> it happening um, and you know I still I'm, 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 I'm still kind of sore about it even to this day but I remember looking online at it again like I don't know 2015 2016 something like that and it looked like it had totally they totally built up a little tourism thing around it. Like there's a uh, little restaurants and stuff. Cause when I looked at it before, it was like, it wasn't really that much out there. So you really had to be kind of self-supported, you know, if you're going to go out there, but it looks like they built up like a little, you know, like a little, I don't know, a little tourism industry, little bed and breakfast and restaurants and shops and stuff like that, which is probably, um, you know, not good for certain reasons, but also means that it might be easier to, to get there for some of us. Yeah, there was a, a little bit of that when I was there. There's probably now, after the Dan Brown book and stuff, there's probably a shitload of stuff there. There's, mm -hmm. there's probably Ramada nearby or something. Right. Because uh, <laughs> at the time, you could only stay in one other hotel that was near there. And it was uh -huh. a hotel that had a whole bizarre history around it, and aerial photos of this hotel look like the outline of the Madonna and Child. So uh -huh. this place was somehow tied into that, and there were all these weird um, sort of occult types there. There was a, uh, you know, we had dinner with all these people who had this intimate knowledge of the whole story of Ren Le Chateau, and one guy is a guy who said he'd uh, record, um, he translated the world's oldest book, and it was a history of Atlantis called The History of Atlant. 
and that it was in some unknown language, and it was a, a typeface that looked very, very runic. It was uh -huh. all based on like a, a hexagon. All the letters could be formed within the confines of a hexagon, and wow. uh, and he had some weird chateau someplace, some castle where once a year light would come through a certain window and light up an altar and a fire would just form on this altar. And they had wow. people from all over the world in there to try to figure out why this happened or how it happened. And none of the experts could figure out why. Oh, wow. Yeah. So oh, it's a very interesting place. But yeah, there was a bookstore there called The Devil's Thumbprint, I think. And it was like a lot of books about the Cathars and the Templars and, you know. Red wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a, that, that reminds me, I got a, um, a Czech version of the Satanic Bible. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I was like, cool. It's in Czech. That's awesome. And it, it looks really nice. It's like hardcover. Um, wow. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, oh, and you've been to Russia too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably going back this February to do show, uh, in Moscow and one in St. Petersburg. Oh, that's awesome. So Yeah, uh, yeah, I had the best time when I was there before. So this is something else that, that we have in common. I went to Russia and played a show in Moscow with uh, the band uh, Red Flag, you know, the um, um, kind of a new wave band from, you know, 1988. They had a, a Russian radio, and uh, if I ever... Anyhow... They were like reformed. Like Red, Red Flag, were they, um, were they the group that did some Manson songs and did like songs from Bewitched and stuff? Two brothers? Uh, yeah, they're two brothers, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Chris Reynolds, um, Chris Reynolds and uh, his, his brother, I can't remember his brother's name. Uh, his brother died, and then he reformed the band. And um, I went on tour with them for a little while uh, playing uh, Trigger Pad. And we went and did a show in Russia, in Moscow, and this was like 2007. And, and it was amazing. I had so much fun. I was in the backstage, and it's like, I know a little bit of German, like just enough, you know, it's like if people are drinking, we can, we can talk. And so there's people there who spoke German. There's people there who speak Russian. And then um, that band, Clan of Zymox, was there. And, so like, everyone in that band is, like, from somewhere, you know, Estonia or Italy or <laughs> something like that. So there's just all these languages going on. Everyone's, like, drinking and having a good time. I just had the fucking best time. And the Russian people, they, they, they're so musical, you know? It's like during the day, during the day, and, and you tell me if you had this experience, but during the day, Everyone's like really somber and quiet and, and really like down to business and very unemotional. But as soon as like work is over, then, then, there's, then there's drinks and they get really musical. I mean, people just hanging out in the hotel lobby would start like playing the guitar, you know, and we'd sing Yellow Submarine and stuff like that. It was just <laughs> so much fun, you know. Yeah, have you heard any of those stories about uh, Vladimir Putin when he was a uh, undercover agent in Paris, and he had long no. hair and and he would play the guitar and play these door songs and everybody just he was like some undercover agent for Russia, but everybody thought he was uh, you know just this weird hippie folk singer guy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so what do you think of Russia? How, what's, your, what's been your experience over there? How do you like it? I, I just loved it. I loved the people. I loved the, the food. Uh, I loved the big uh, Soviet monuments. I mean, there's just some fantastic and All this great modernist architecture and, you know, I just, mm -hmm. and, you know, I thought, this, this is weird going to Moscow because, you know, is anybody really going to know who I am? But as it turned out, there was this guy I met, this uh, actor. He's like a Russian uh, action-adventure movie star. And he mm -hmm. was the host of some counterculture show right when things started opening up. And he would always play my music on his show. So this whole generation that saw this show were familiar with, like, music martinis and misanthropy and stuff like that. Oh, and my God. I met what. 
met Russian kids who said, oh, I got all of your albums uh, on cassettes, you know, down in the market uh, on a local square. And mm -hmm. I found that difficult to believe that anybody would be bootlegging my albums. But, uh, yeah, I went over there. I got a huge, um, huge crowd, and I, I was protested by the Russian Orthodox Church because of my connection with LeMay. And yeah. um, I was told these people were, I usually if there are people protesting me, I'll go out and I'll talk to them. And they don't know who I am. They have no idea what I've done. But uh, I was told, don't, these, these people actually are fanatics. They will kill you. Don't go out and talk to these people. But they were actually, they had merch. They were selling t-shirts with these three skulls with knives in their teeth. And the t-shirt said, be, in, in Russian, of course, it said, um, be orthodox or be dead. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so somebody, somebody coming to the show bought, bought me a T-shirt from uh, my protesters. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just um, um, going to say, uh, that actor guy, too, there's this restaurant that is only open to writers and actors, and it was Stalin's favorite restaurant. And I had one of the best meals of my entire life at that place. And it's a place wow. that's like covers an entire city block. And each room is gigantic, but each room is decorated in a specific period from Russian history. So uh -huh. you go through the whole thing, and you just you get to experience every architectural form of every aspect of Russian history. And uh, uh -huh. it was just fantastic. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, my, your scariest um, moment? <laughs> my scariest moment was, um, so after we played the show and we had a day of nothing going on, um, Chris Reynolds and I, we went to um, see, try and see Lennon too, went to Red Square. And we wanted to see uh -huh. Lennon too. And uh, there's one of the girls who was one of the promoters who spoke Russian was with us and taking us here. We went down into the subway system which is really fucking amazing. There's all the, these huge statues that have been there since, you know, pre, you know, World War II era um, that are just really quite extraordinary. And um, see, with the, hotel, the hotel we were staying at, you have to take a ticket from the hotel with you. And um, like when you leave your floor and there's like this lady on the floor that you get the ticket from. So anyhow... It's like I we forgot to grab the ticket because we were like from the oh. we're like what is this you know what is this this is stupid and we just blew it off right and so we didn't have it so anyhow we're in Red Square and uh, one of the you know security guards there like you know you know called us over and he starts he's talking to the girl you know and they're speaking in Russian we don't know what's going on and we realize that they're they're talking more and we realize that you know Chris and I look at each other and we realize there's some kind of problem here and he, he wants to see our passports and she explains or they want to see our, our, our tickets from the hotel which we didn't have and so then he wanted to see our passports and then he took our passports and then they're continuing to talk and that's when I started to get scared I realized they got my passport now you know they could do anything uh, you know it, it, this could go anywhere and um, there's nothing I could do about it and eventually what happened is one of the other promoters went by our old hotel, got our tickets, and came down there and showed them to the guy. And that was, that was enough, and he let us go. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and you, you know, we kept, kept having to remind ourselves that it's not Soviet anymore, right? It's not Soviet anymore. <laughs> but, but the culture feels like, you know, it feels like, you know, um, it's different. You know, it's different. But um, anyhow, that was my that, that's my scary story from Russia. But other than that, you know, so like, the, you're you're right. It's like the the food is just amazing. The people are amazing, and I just I I loved it and and, and look for any opportunity to try and get back there again sometime. So did did you ever actually get into Lenin's tomb? No, we didn't get into it. It was closed, so we just looked at it from the outside and took a picture. Yeah, because. Crispin Glover said, you know, Boyd, if you ever find yourself in Moscow, you've got to check out Lenin's tomb because I don't mm -hmm. know what they did to him, but the way they embalmed him, it looks as though he was just alive earlier in the day. You know, he looks mm -hmm. absolutely alive. He looks kind of like yeah. a waxworks figure, but he looks 
you know, perfectly preserved. And uh, right. he said, it's unbelievable. But by the time I went there, I think they've got a thing now where the public can't see Lenin's tomb anymore. Or maybe yeah. it's open like one day a year or one day a month or something. So, yeah. And so you I know that, uh, that. that embalming, that, that thing with Lenin and how they embalmed his body, that's all connected with the Soviet, uh, Soviet cosmism, which is basically the, um, the backbone of the Soviet space program, which was based on the philosophies of this guy named uh, Fedorov, who was around at the time of like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and these guys. And he had a theory that eventually we will be able to, through science and technology, we will be able to recombine the dead molecules of everyone who has ever lived before and bring people back from the dead. And, you know, we will... Wow. Right, and we will resurrect our fathers... And then that generation will work on the next, resurrecting the next genera- generation back. And eventually we're going to bring back everybody. And it, 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 this ties in with, like, Russian, you know, the orthodox perspective on, on the apocalypse and shit. And the Soviet space program, when that was born, they picked up on these ideas. Because if you're going to repopulate the world like that, you're going to run out of space. And we need to, that's why we need to colonize space. And that's why they needed to build rockets and um, point, you know, Fedorov said we, he read an article that in America where Americans were like pointing cannons at the sky to try and get it to rain. And he said, that's what we have <laughs> in Russia. We have to point our cannons at the sky. And that was the motivation for the, uh, for the Soviet, for the Soviet space program. And so that's why they had all this stuff with, you know, um, you know, how they embalmed Lenin. And stuff because well he might be literally he might be coming back you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah well supposedly uh, they sent uh, Ava Perone's body to uh, Russia to have her embalmed in the same way I mean her body looked absolutely lifelike but I think um, her husband got out of power before he was going to build a giant tower where people would like climb all these stairs and then see her body lying in a glass coffin well, so I don't know that ever happened to him, but uh, I wish he'd finish that before he uh, kicked the bucket or whatever happened. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let's change gears because I want to talk to you about Throbbing Gristle. I know you 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 went and worked with Throbbing Gristle like back in the day, and I want to hear about that. Do you have any stories? Oh. Yeah, do I have stories? Yeah, I was actually um, corresponding with them um, mm-hmm. the, when they were an art group, before they started uh, doing their band, and they had just started doing TG. But I oh. you know, wrote letters to uh, Jen and Cozy and stuff, and, and uh, all, they were part of this uh, male art movement, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Kirk from Cabaret Voltaire was involved in that. So I was in touch with him before, um, you know, before anybody knew who Cabaret Voltaire was, just because we had wow. a mutual interest in Dadaism. So, um, yeah, so I wrote Jen and Cozy, and I, I, there were like some men's magazines over here that had uh, pictures of the, them wearing the Gary Gilmore shirt they did. And so I sent uh-huh. them copies of these magazines. They would write me when the first time I was staying in San Francisco, and then... First time I went to London on May uh, 78, I went over to their um, studio at 10 Martello Street. And just when I got there, Cozy was coming up the steps. And and she had these, uh, this eye makeup like Twiggy or something. And she's wearing a super short dress and and she just looked fabulous and mod and Uh stuff. And um, so she invited me back to their, um, back to their place. um, what's the name of that street? Um, and, uh, anyway, um, it's a street a lot of people lived on at one time or another. It became like uh-huh. a little mecca for people. But uh, so then eventually I, I met Jen, and then I met um, Sleazy and Chris, and uh, you know every time I'd go to London, I'd, I'd sort of see them and hang out with them. So this uh-huh. was like I, I I got there when I met them. It's like 
their first single, United, had just come out. And uh, the first annual report had just come out. And it had, uh, you know, there were 750 copies or something, and they had sold out. So whenever they saw a copy in a store, they would buy it and then, you know, allow their friends to reimburse them for it. So it was <laughs> kind of like a, a big black market for that. And, and John Savage had written a big article about uh, Throbbing Gristle. And um, everybody read it, and they were just thrilled about everything that uh, TG said, and they couldn't wait to hear the record, but you couldn't get it. And, and you know, I was at a party where these people actually had the record, and they were playing first annual report. And people were talking, had been talking earlier about how much they liked Throbbing Gristle. And then at a certain point they said, what the hell is this that we're listening to in here? And I said, that's <laughs> Throbbing Gristle. They said, this is Throbbing Gristle? You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, people, you know, I was interested, I was attracted to Jen because um, we had a mutual interest in, like, true crime figures and, you know, Manson and Ian Brady and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's like, at that time, Literally nobody in the entire world found that stuff interesting. And people thought that if you were interested in that, that you were probably a murderer. So I remember uh -huh. I went, uh, I spent the night over at uh, his house one night, and uh, people were saying, you're actually going to spend the night at Genesis P. Orge's house? I said, yeah, why, why not? And they said, this guy's into Charlie Manson and stuff. What, you know, he might kill you. I said, he, you know, actually, he served me tea and biscuits and, you know, zipped uh -huh. up my sleeping bag for me, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, I played with them at, I was in Germany and I was in Berlin playing the show at the Excess Club and I knew they were coming into town. Uh, I told them I'd be there and they all showed up when, for my concert in Berlin and, uh, after the show, Jen says, well, you know, you should uh, stay in Berlin and you could open up for us, you know, be like a, a united front, you know, a non and TG against the world. So I said, okay. And I, I think, as far as I know, that's the only time Robin Gristle ever had an opening band. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So I discovered Robin Gristle, like, yeah, it had to be like 1980. Shoe or something like that um, at the at a used record store in in Lincoln, Nebraska, and oh. you know, everyone I knew was into um, you know what do you call it? like like kind of the indie post punk thing, you know everyone was into you know New Order and um, you know you know Cocteau Twins and 4AD you know all the stuff on 4AD. Um, all that kind of stuff, and, and, and I found the album Heathen Earth, and, uh -huh. and, I, and, and I thought, this looks like really cool, and, and, and it reminded me, because it, it seemed satanic, right, because I'd also read the satanic Bible, and I was into that kind of stuff, and so I got it because of that, and that's still today, that, that's probably my favorite TG album, uh, next to that big second annual report, and... Um, you know, and, and, and I, I, the shit kept showing up in the used section there. So whoever was getting great, the <laughs> records, they'd buy them. You know, they're buying from the regular record store because they thought it was cool, but then they'd listen to it, and they'd be like, what is this? And um, they'd get rid of it. So I picked them all up. So I got all this old TG vinyl still. And, I mean, to me, that was, to me, that's industrial music, right? They had industrial records. They started, that's the first time I encountered that term, you know, uh, industrial applied to music, and um, and and you know, to me, that's where it all started. And then shortly after that, because I was into Throbbing Gristle, eventually I met someone else who's into that and PTV. And then the research guides come up, and that's where I first started hearing about you know the stuff that you were doing at the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's like it's funny because that whole industrial movement, all the people in that industrial culture handbook are so different from one to the other. 
but they're all lumped into this category just because they were all doing stuff that you yeah. know, didn't sound like what most other people were doing. And um, since Robin Gristle had come up with a uh, you know the catchphrase industrial music, critics love that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I purposely didn't make up a, a moniker for what I did. I thought I don't want to say that it's this kind of music or that kind of music. And having not done that, I got lumped in with industrial music, but which is right. fine with me, you know. So and and non is is was non is that your kind of like your first musical project? No, um, the first musical stuff I did was stuff like. Um, my first album, The Black Album, it was kind of this uh, atmospheric ambient music. But then I started, after I got into that, I started doing noise music at the same time. So I was giving performances of noise music in uh, various art galleries up and down California. And then mm -hmm. uh, I met Zev at one of them, a place in San Francisco called La Manel. Oh, yeah. And Zeb was just um, starting out playing at the Mabuhay Gardens, which was a big punk rock place in San Francisco. And uh -huh. he said, you know, you ought to get into the center playing this uh, punk circuit because nobody's figured out what punk is yet. So somebody like me could sneak in, you know, like sneaking into the circus or something, and people don't know that it's not, you know, part of the punk scene. So uh -huh. I started doing that, and it's like, you know, we do performances in art galleries, and you know, we wouldn't be paid a cent, but we, we would show up in these little rock and roll clubs, and it was, you know, it was like we were taking our music right to the street. It was like we were taking it to people who weren't just art people sort of scratching their chin and figuring out what the subtext was of what you were doing, you know, just people who experienced it. And this so, was in San Francisco? Yeah, well... San Francisco, and then there were clubs like that in San Diego, clubs like that in L.A., and then me and Zeb went to play Boston. We played at uh, New York and, uh, you know, all over the place. So I'm just trying to connect it all with other things. So what kind of, uh, punk, what kind of punk bands were you about that you, like, got to do shows with? At the um, I, I regularly did shows with these bands, uh, Monitor, the Human Hands, and the Bee People. But I played on all sorts of bills. I opened for Wall of Voodoo. Uh, oh. A band that was around that was really great at the time was called The Screamers. And okay. they were just, it was an all-electronic punk band. And it was okay. just really visceral, ear-piercing stuff. And they were so amazing. Everybody expected them to be the next big thing, and everybody wanted to sign them, but they were holding out to do a video disc, and oh. they never got the opportunity to do that, so <laughs> unfortunately, you know, <laughs> they went nowhere. Yeah. Wow, and, and Wall of Voodoo, that's, that's, that's pretty intense. That's, that's one of those bands that... Um, I, you know, they were just so, they, you know, everyone likes Mexican radio, but the album that they put out, they had all these other songs on it, like Lost Weekend and stuff like that. It's like really an underrated band. It's like, whatever happened to them, you know? Yeah, I don't, I'm surprised you're hearing about a, um, you know, reunion tour with them. Right. Anybody else is doing it. Right, because their music is out there. I mean, for whatever reason, it's like, I mean, that, you know, Mexican radio has just been, I mean, I think that, that charted or something. It's been like, you know, just replicated like a meme forever. So it seems like they could easily get back together, you know, or maybe, you know, if there's only one guy left who's alive, he could, you know, get it back together and, and uh, have a good time with it. Yeah, who was the lead singer? Was his name Stan? I don't know. I have no idea. Oh, because I know that the night I opened for them, I had to, like, I was going out of the country the next day or something, so I had to, uh, you know, leave before the whole evening was over. And the, the lead singer for the Wall of Voodoo kept calling me long distance in San Diego saying, hey, I've still got this $75 for you. When are you going to be ah. here again? <laughs> so that's why you... Stan Ridgeway. He still owes you Stan Ridgeway. <laughs> oh, no, I think he, he eventually gave it uh, to somebody I knew or something. I eventually ended up getting that, uh, you know, that's, Stan Ridgeway was the guy's name. Yeah, the singer. That sounds right. That sounds right. <laughs> oh, my God, that's awesome. 
Okay, so I got to ask a little bit about uh, one of my favorite Boyd Rice albums from back in the day was Hatesville. And okay, and um, around that time, I I was hatched as uh, Fritz Partridge, and uh, you know Gittle was kind of my kind of like you know led me through that process at the time, and the Partridge Family Temple was totally a thing. In, in Kenosha at one point. Can you talk a little oh, bit yeah. about the Partridge Family Temple? Okay, well, um, I, when the Partridge Family was on, I mean, I was probably 16 or 17. I was probably too old to be watching it, but I, I, I never missed it. I really liked it, and I liked their music. So um, when I moved to Denver, we were waiting to go into this record store called Wax Rex, waiting to cross the street. And this car drove by, and it was completely covered in bubble gum and had little toys glued on it and stuff. And I said, <laughs> I, I'd, like to, you know, I'd like to know the story behind that. I'd like to meet the people who are driving in that car. And the girl with me said, oh, yeah, those are the guys from the Partridge Family Temple. And I said, what's that? And she said, They've got this whole religion based around the Partridge family where, you know, there's this mother goddess and Lori's the, the scarlet whore of Babylon and, you know, Keith is the god of war and Danny's the trickster god. And I said, i got to fucking meet these people. So I was writing for this magazine, this free giveaway magazine at the time called Colorado Music Magazine. It's one of those, like, newspapers. It's, it's free in every record store. So I pitched to them the idea of, like, I want to go up and interview these Partridge Family Temple people. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be fun. So it ended up, they, they were on the cover of this magazine. It's like it was Dan and Sean Partridge uh, inside a hollowed out TV set, you know. And mm -hmm. so that was their first major publicity. Besides, they got some publicity because uh, they were, uh, got thrown out of a David Cassidy concert for handing out Partridge Family Temple stickers. And the police thought they were handing out LSD with pictures of the Partridge Family on it. Yeah. And that's what, that's what Danny Bonaducci were told, was told. He, he, he said, what's, what's all this ruckus? And they said, oh, we had these members of a weird cult, and they were passing out the LSD with your pictures on it. And he said, wow, that's great. <laughs> so, so he thought it was cool. It scared the hell out of David Cassidy. <laughs> Danny's always the coolest. Yeah, yeah. So then... Uh, yeah, so I... I, I, um, there, so. I, I Well, I just met them, and then, um, you know... I got a letter from Dan after I, I interviewed them in Boulder in front of the Mork and Mindy house. And uh, a week later, I got a, re um, a letter arrived for me. It was addressed to Boyd Partridge. It was from Dan. So it's like I sort of became part of the, you know, it's like I was hanging out with those guys. And they had a whole network of people here, a whole network of these people who are like wearing this groovy kind of 70s clothing and big floppy hats that look like the American flag and stuff. <laughs> it, it, it was fun. We had a lot of fun when those people all lived here in Denver still. Yeah. Now they've scattered across the globe to spread the word. <laughs> so what about uh, Gittle? Do you ever talk to her anymore? No. You know, nobody talks to her anymore. She's just um, she's a pathological liar, you know. Okay. It's a shame. It's a shame. But, you know, it's like, her father thought I was crazy when I said, I'm, I'm not having anything more to do with your daughter. And he's like, boy, uh -huh. what the hell is your problem? And then he eventually realized, like, yeah, she's a little crazy. She's a little bit of a pathological liar. And people who, when I say, listen, you're going on the Internet telling lies about me. Don't put words in my mouth. Don't say I've said things that I haven't said. She said, I didn't do that. I said, I've seen it. So, you know, she did that one too many times, and it's just like, no, and uh, most of the people who, who knew her just said, you know, it's like Matt Skiba is a friend of mine. You know, he's in Blink-182 and the Alkaline Trio, and he knew yeah. her, and he said, you know, I, I, I really like Gittle, but I, she's too much negative energy. You know, I can't be around her because I'm a very yeah. positive guy, you know. 
I don't yeah. want to be around somebody who has enemies and you know wants to destroy people and wants to ruin their lives. Yeah. So, um, I. So, but the other partridges are great, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. So I remember the first time I remember uh, meeting Gittle was was when I was touring with uh, Morphine Angel, and uh, we had like a night off, and we were near Pittsburgh, and the Hellfire Club was playing in Pittsburgh with uh, Spawn Ranch. And and we were in touch with Thomas and said, hey, well, you're in the neighborhood. Come hang out with us. And so we went and, and hung out with them during their show. And and this is where Gil was, like, like met, had uh, hooked up with them on the road, and she was, like, merchandising for them. And she was going around, like, drawing X's on everyone's foreheads that night. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the Matt did, – did you know the Spawn Ranch guy, Matt Green? Um, yeah. I, I I knew one of those guys. I knew the guy whose um, brother was on um, American Idol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. American Idol. That's actually the last time I saw Giddle was when American Idol was on. We were watching it, and it, what it's uh, co- co- a- Ethan. Ethan is the guy, and then it's his yeah. brother Constantine or something like Constantine. that. Constantine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, like, he's doing it. It's like that first season, I think, of uh, American Idol, when everyone's watching it. And I, it's, I watch it with, with my wife, and it's like the, the, the camera pans out over the crowd. It's like, oh, my God, that's that Gittle chick. <laughs> but she was the kind of girl that um, always hated, always had a problem. She never, she was never anyone's girlfriend, and she always had a problem with everyone else's girlfriend. So it was just always, <laughs> You know what I mean? But. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Problems, Anyhow. problems, problems. Always need somebody to hate, you know. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of negative energy. But anyhow, um, there was always that Partridge Family Temple movement, that whole idea, that meme, that, that feel. It was all about positivity, you know. And for me... I mean, I, I watched, you know, uh, that television show when I was, I was probably like, you know, you know, six, seven years old when it was like playing on TV. I was related to Danny. Danny was the guy in the, in the group that was like closest to my age. And so, I don't know, oh. you know, I, 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 I took a, uh, a low key, you know, mischievous imprint and I ended up playing a bass too, like, like, <laughs> But, um, I, you know, I always, like, took a lot of uh, inspiration out of that, that Partridge Family Temple and, and, and thought that was a real fun thing. Yeah, well, I, I mean, talking to Sean Partridge on the phone is like um, is taking a roller coaster ride on LSD or something. I mean, it's, you can't talk to this guy without just being transported into his universe, and it's a completely mm-hmm. alternate universe where – Everything is fun and everything, you know, fast food restaurants have a mystical significance. And, you know, it's, if you treat everything that way, everything has that power. Everything's imbued with that power. You know, yeah. it's really, uh, you know, it really is a religion based on fun. Yeah. And that's very satanic, too, to bring it all back to uh, Satanism and the sort of magic that, Anton LaVey wove has this idea that you, your inner wish, your inner you know, vision about how the world should be, you have the power to, through the power of your mind, to create a world like that, to make a world like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what I have... Um these ideas about the alchemy of aesthetics, about how you can apply aesthetics to your life. And well, they have these ideas about people creating total environments. And mm-hmm. very few people I know actually bother to do this. But you can. Mm-hmm. Like people come, movers come in, like a couple of Mexican guys like carrying in a couch to our house. And one of them will like look around and go, who designed your house, man? Stanley Kubrick? It's <laughs> like everybody relates to my house. Everybody says, this looks like something out of Clockwork Orange, you know. So, and it, it, it's like I'm living in this beautiful, ultra-modern 
movie set with all this amazing stuff from 1969, 1970. Mm -hmm. So you can remake your world. You know, it's like this is a place that if I could never leave this house, I would never leave it because uh, yeah. nothing outside is as, in as interesting as this. And when we were talking about people and their options earlier, that's something I was thinking of commenting on. It's like, I know people who are rich. I know people who are millionaires. And you go to their houses, and they've done nothing particularly special with it. They've, you know, mm -hmm. just it looks like they randomly bought one piece of something here, one piece of something from someplace else. And it's just like you think your, your house is like your life. You could turn it into whatever you want it to be. It's like the limits are only that of your imagination, mm -hmm. you know, and, and people don't do it. So that's yeah. <laughs> that's so good for me. I'm living the ideal life, and everybody else is um, creating problems where they don't exist and uh, enjoying being yeah. miserable. Yeah. Now most people are miserable and unhappy because that's where they want to be, and so you create the world that you create your reality. So that's uh, um, something that you know is just the way it is. So, so Boyd, you got a new album coming out too. Aren't you working on some new music? Yeah, I, I finished this album about <clears throat> maybe three years ago, and it's just been held up. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I just recently heard from uh, the guy at Mute Records, and he says, now the release date, I uh, heard a little while ago it was going to be uh, September, so I was looking forward to it coming out soon, but now they say it's going to be October. So it's going to be uh, on vinyl. It's going to be a two-record set and a gatefold album, and each side of the record is just like a twenty-minute drone. Mm -hmm. It's really loud and harsh, and uh, uh -huh. and some people who've heard it think it's you know the best thing I've ever done, and wow. and I sort of think think that too because <laughs> it's it's. A, it's a, sort of the truest thing to my initial intention of just doing something absolutely as minimal as you can be. And I had this idea when I was a teenager that uh, if you had one single tone and you played it so loud that it blocked out all other sounds, you'd be creating this kind of artificial silence. Because I felt that, like the world is too full of distractions. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's very difficult anymore to have... Uh, just time alone with your mind for undirected thought, because unless you're on yeah. the toilet or in the bathtub, you know, there's always some sort of sound going on. Yeah. Intruding. Excellent. That's awesome. Well, I yeah. look forward to the release, release of that. Um, and, man, this has just been an incredible conversation. There's so much, there's so much we talked about that just resonates so strongly. Um, do you have any final words for all of our listeners out there that might help them through the dark times that lie before us? Um, go on Amazon.com and buy my new book, The Last Testament of Anton Zandor LeVay. It's a very fun read, and I think it paints a good portrait of the, the old man that I knew way back when. Excellent. And I re reiterate that, yes, everyone pick up this book. It's awesome. I've greatly enjoyed it. There's so much great material in here, so many great memories that you're sharing and, and excellent photographs. So it's, it's a wonderful offering. I highly recommend it. And, um, yeah, and when it, it debuted on Amazon as number one bestseller in the uh, category of religious studies. And I think they must have gotten some feedback about that because it vanished from the religious studies category and reappeared as the number one bestseller on Satanism and demonology in that <laughs> category. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that means you're definitely... Um, you're definitely uh, turning over, kicking over some tabernacles there somewhere. So that's a, that's a good thing. So I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. So, all right. Well, Boyd, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us this evening. Keep yeah, it's, it's been excellent. 
It's been excellent. And I, I got, I wish I could say, I have so many great Genesis P. Orich stories that I wish I could have thought of uh, something really amusing for you. Because there's all these, uh, you know, stuff like, uh, there's a rumor at one time, somebody um, stole Charlie Chaplin's cadaver, and the rumor was going around that it was me and Genesis P. Orich. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, that's crazy. But you hadn't. No. No. Okay. <laughs> but that so, was happening. That happened right bef at the time right before I went to, uh, and played with them at the SO 36 in Berlin. So oh, we okay. discussed it in the coffee, uh, coffee bar there. So what we should do is have you uh, come back on the show, like after the album comes out, let's have you come back on the show and we'll make a point uh, to, we'll make it a, a music and Genesis Peorge anecdotes show. <laughs> I got a couple of, I got a couple of, I, I, I talked to him via email, I was in a band, we did a cover of, um, of um, Good Vibrations, and oh. um, had some exchanges with him about that, and then um, and then I saw them go play in Houston, and 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 had an exchange with them there. So we could totally do like an anecdote thing, and I'm sure you've got some incredible stories from back in the day. I would love to hear all those, man. That would just be awesome. Okay, well, um, make a few notes uh, for for the next yeah. time and set them aside. Definitely. So, yeah. excellent. Cool.